Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. <laughs> okay, so um, next speaker of this morning is uh, Bianca uh, Verai, uh, who is going to talk about the, the CM method in Genus 2. Okay, uh, I'd like to first thank the organizers um, for giving me the opportunity to speak. As you see, I am going to be giving a board talk, so if it's too small, then just yell, write larger, just whenever you feel like it. Alternatively, you can sit closer. I promise I don't bite or will not spray water guns or anything like that. OK, so um, I'm speaking on EGUSA class polynomials, embeddings of quartic CM fields, and arithmetic intersection theory. Um, I will give background on all of it, so it hopefully won't be as intimidating as it sounds. Um, this is all joint work with Helen Grudman, uh, Jennifer Johnson Lung, Kristen Lauder, Adriana Salerno, and Erica Wittenborn. OK, so uh, the motivation for this problem is looking at the CM method for genus 2. So uh, first, let me review uh, the genus 1 case. Uh, Francois Morin mentioned this briefly on day 1, but I'm just going to review it. So step one is to compute the Hilbert class polynomial. Uh, and as mentioned, there are three methods for doing this. There's the complex method. This was uh, first done by Atkin and Mora in 93. Then there's the Chinese remainder theorem method. This was done by Agashi, Lauder, and Venkatesen in 04. And then, uh, I guess, out of order, but it's also the Piatic method. It was first studied by Kuvenia and Henoch in 02. OK. so. First, we compute this Hilbert class polynomial, polynomial using uh, your favorite method from here. And then step two is to find a root of your Hilbert class polynomial mod p. And step three is then to construct an elliptic curve E with J invariant J0. OK, so I'm not going to go into the details, but this is the outline. Um, so what is the analog in the genus 2 case? OK, so the J invariant gets replaced with the Igusa invariance, I1, I2, I3. So uh, this isn't exactly correct to completely determine every genus 2 curve. You actually need 10 Igusa invariants. But uh, for the vast majority of cases, so for instance, if the first Igusa invariant is non-zero and your characteristic of your ground field is not 2 or 3, then these three values completely determine the isomorphism class. So it's not completely true, but it's true in enough cases that that's all we're going to work with. OK, and then we have the Hilbert class polynomial. So this gives you genus 1 curves, which have complex multiplication by the ring of integers uh, in a quadratic imaginary field. So instead of looking. At a quadratic imaginary field, we look at the ring of integers in K, 
where k is uh, totally imaginary uh, quadratic extension. It's probably small. totally imaginary quadratic extension over a real quadratic field f. So we call k a quartic CM field. Okay, And throughout the, my talk, k will refer to a quartic CM field, and f will always be the real quadratic <coughs> subfield. OK, so then the Hilbert class polynomial gets replaced with three polynomials. And you define it as you take the product over all genus 2 curves and you have, that have an embedding of OK into the endomorphism ring of the Jacobian. OK, and then you take x minus the goose invariant at C. OK, so we have three of these polynomials. And then we want to do the same thing. Step one is compute HJ of OK for all J. And again, we have the exact analog. So there's a complex method studied first by Schbalik in 94, von Wommelen in 99, and Wang in 03. Oh, I should mention, so this is not a complete list of the people who have done this. There are many, many more people, but the list is much longer than on this side. So this one, I only have the first people. OK, and then there's the CRT method, which was done by Eisentrager and Lauder in 05. And then the p-adic method, which was studied by Godry, Hartman, Cole, Ritzenthaler. And Vang, this was in 06. OK, so uh, that's step one. And even though what I wrote on the board looks like an exact analog, there's actually uh, a major difference between the two cases. OK, so the Hilbert class polynomial is always has integer coefficients. So when you, uh, so these methods, for instance, the complex method, you take the J invariants, compute them as complex numbers out to a certain precision, multiply all the roots together, and then recognize what the integer coefficient should be. And as long as you have sufficient precision, this is possible. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, the Igusa class polynomials, these have coefficients in Q. So if you do the same method, you need to have a bound on the size of the denominators in order to know what precision you compute to. And in fact, that's true for all of these methods. All of these methods require as input not only the quartic CM field, but also a bound on the denominators. OK. so. Uh, to, for the CM method in genus 2, what we really want, you want a bound on the denominators. Of these Igusa class polynomials. And ideally, you would like the bound to be very sharp. I mean, if you think of how I described it, computing the precision, if you have a bound, but it's much too large, then you're going to be computing lots of extraneous precision, which can sh slow down your algorithm quite a bit. So we really, it's not just that we want a bound, but we would like our bound to be as sharp as possible. 
Okay, so what's been done so far? So in 2003, Lauder conjectured that the primes appearing in the denominators uh, are bounded by the discriminant of your quartic CM field and uh, that they divide the discriminant of the field minus some integer squared. Okay. So it turns out that this divisibility condition, divisibility, follows from work of Gorin in 97 plus a few additional observations. But the main bulk of the work was in this paper of Gorin. Okay. And then in 2007, Gorin and Lauder uh, proved a bound on the primes and then earlier this year they proved a bound on the valuations. So it's the valuations of the primes of the denominator. Um, OK. Uh, so certainly while a bound is good, I mean, this now turns these methods into something which only require a quartic CM field as the input. You don't have to give anything else about the denominators because you can use, use these results. But unfortunately, these bounds are not very sharp. So we would still like to get something that's a little bit better. OK, so uh, something I'll mention just as a note, which we'll return to later. So both of these papers heavily use uh, what we call the embedding problem. To prove the results. OK, so we'll return to this later. OK, so now we've seen two out of the three things in the title. That's good. All right, so uh, to continue and see how we can maybe get a better handle on these denominators, we need to look uh, closer at what the definition of these goose invariants is. I mean, all I told you before is that they determine the isomorphism class, but that doesn't help you compute them. Um, OK, so. so let me first mention that there are multiple ways of defining the Gusa invariants, um, some of which may turn out for better for other, other methods. Um, for what I'm going to say in this talk, the definition I'll describe is the best. So this is only one of many other possible approaches, and I'm not claiming this is the best in general, just the most relevant for today. OK, so given a genus 2 curve, C, you can send it to an abelian surface, namely by just taking its Jacobian. And this map is injective. If you have two non-isomorphic genus 2 curves, you send them to your Jacobian, you'll get two non-isomorphic Jacobians. Okay, so instead of thinking of the Angus invariants as functions on genus 2 curves, we can think of the Angus invariants as functions on the moduli space of abelian surfaces. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Um, no, no particular field, just a field. Okay, so think of Ugusa invariants as functions on the moduli space 
of principally polarized abelian varieties, ab abelian surfaces. Okay, so um, I'm going to write out an expression uh, for these Egus invariants. It's not going to make much sense at the beginning, but hopefully in a few, a few seconds it will. Okay, so we can write the first one in this form. The second one can be defined like this. Okay, so there's all these chi's and psi's floating around. What they are is not so important. The, the remarks that are important is that uh, psi 4, psi 6, chi 10, and chi 12, so all of these functions that are appearing uh, have no poles. On the moduli space of of smooth abelian surfaces. So that means if I take any smooth abelian surface and evaluate uh, these functions on that surface, I will always get a finite number. I will never get something that's infinity. And the other remark is that chi 10 is the only function in the denominator. Okay, so um, let's tie this back into what we were thinking about. Uh, what we want to study is the denominator, pri what primes are appearing and to what power they appear. So if you have a prime appearing in the denominator, then if you look over FP, then that will be an undefined function. You'll have a pole at that function. So the primes that appear in the denominator correspond exactly to the primes such that there's a genus 2 curve with CM so that chi 10 has a 0 there. So none of these can be infinity. The only way this function can be infinity is if chi 10 is 0. That's the only way this happens. Okay. So that means So that means that the p-valuation of the denominators is bounded above by the number of zeros of chi 10 uh, at the CM points over FP bar. Okay, so you take a curve over FP bar with CM, and if the function, uh, uh, if chi 10 is zero at that point, Whatever its, whatever its order of vanishing is, you will get that many primes appearing in your denominator. Okay, it's a little bit annoying, but if you sort of unravel these definitions, this is exactly what it's saying. Um, I lied slightly because it's really bounded above by a suitable multiple. 
because we have either the chi 10 to the sixth or chi 10 cubed, but I mean, that factor is not so important. The, the upshot of this is that if you can understand the zeros of chi 10 and to what multiplicity they occur, then you understand the denominators of the Augusta class polynomials. Okay? All right. So that was a little bit annoying trip into moduli spaces and moduli interpretations, and hopefully now we're going to back out of that and come back to something more concrete. Okay, so after doing this, the upshot is that you can get a statement like the following. So if you take one-sixth times the p-valuation of the denominator, okay, let me write bigger. So this is maybe the main point, so if you can't see this, then really you should tell me. Okay, so one-sixth of the p-valuation of the denominator of the constant term of H1, okay, this up to cancellation. Okay, so the only reason why I took H1 here is because I want to know what factor to multiply by up front. But I could do, you could choose H2 or H3, and then you would take chi 1 fourth or also 1 fourth. Okay, so using the moduli interpretation, what I just said, so this value is equal to the number of embeddings of OK into an endomorphism ring of a product of two elliptic curves uh, this is counted up to isomorphism and with multiplicity So from going from here to here, uh, so this, by what I said, is just basically just telling you the number of zeros of chi 10. So you can use the moduli interpretation of chi 10. The points in chi 10 where chi 10 is 0 corresponds exactly to the abelian surfaces that are products of two elliptic curves. So your abelian surface is just of the form E cross E prime. It has CM, so you want OK embedded into it. Uh, the condition that OK embedded into it basically implies that these two elliptic curves are super singular. So this is just trying to back us out of thinking of a concrete interpretation of these zeros of chi 10. And then, uh, then this is also equal to the p part of the arithmetic intersection number. So you take div chi 10 dotted with the CM cycle, and you want just the P part of that. OK, so now using this interpretation, this moduli interpretation, we get three, these three equivalent things. And so maybe you're not so convinced. I mean, I told you I was trying to get to more concrete things, but I have all these ugly words up here. I have this arithmetic intersection number. It looks like maybe I just lied to you. But I promise, I didn't. OK. OK, so the point is, is that this ugly thing, there's a conjectural formula for, which removes all of the arithmetic intersection theory and all of this. So, in 2006, Brunier and Yang uh, gave a conjectural formula for this div chi 10 uh, dot the CM cycle. 
under the assumption that the discriminant of the real quadratic field is 1 mod 4 and prime. Okay. Um, and actually, Yang has proved this conjecture assuming that d tilde, which is the norm of the relative discriminant, is prime. And two, that OK is freely generated over OF and eta has a certain form. So I'm pretty sure this condition on the form of eta follows from um, this condition, but I haven't worked out all the details. But uh, anyway, so the point is, is that this condition is not really that strong, but this one is a very strong condition. OK, so um, okay, let me now write their conjectural formula. So uh, their con they actually gave a formula for a more general case than this intersection number, but it, um, it gives you a formula for the intersection number we care about. OK, so this p part, this d of chi 10 with the cm points at p, this is equal to you sum over an integer m such that m is of the form d minus x squared over 4 for some x in z. Oh, you want m to be positive. And then you sum over. Uh, prime ideals, oh sorry, I need a little bit of notation. So k tilde is the reflex field and f tilde is the real subfield, real quadratic subfield of k tilde. You don't really need to have a good understanding of what the reflex field is, it's just some other quartic CM field and there is a formula, an explicit way to get it from k. It's just, just some other field. So you take primes in the uh, ring of integers of OF, where they lie over your p. And then you take something of the form m plus m, square root of d tilde over 2d. You want this to be in the inverse of the relative discriminant ideal. And you want the absolute value of n to be less than m times square root of d tilde. Then we have this bt of p. OK, so this is 0 if p is split in k tilde. And we get, so we get the p valuation of t plus 1 times this row value of t. OK, then we get the inertial degree, because otherwise. OK, and this row, so rho of an ideal a is equal to the number of integral ideals in the ring of integers of k tilde such that the norm equals the one you started with. OK, so that was a long time to write. And it looks very ugly and involved. But if you look at it, this is very easy to compute on a computer. So if you, um, 
you know, as long as your d tilde and d are not so large, which we also have this assumption in the CM case in genus 1, these factors are very easy to compute. You're just looking at the splitting behavior of an ideal in a quartic field, and you're taking the p-valuation. This is something that's easy to plug in and easy to do, even though it's ugly to write down. But so if this formula, so we have it proved in these two cases, if it was true in all cases, this would be great, because uh, this 1 6 of this this up to cancellation, so this bound is very sharp. The only time that it's not equal to the actual valuation of what's in the denominators is when you have zeros of psi 6, chi 12, or psi 4 at the same points where you have zeros of chi 10. And I don't know if this is a theorem, but certainly experimentally this rarely happens. So if this, we could use this uh, conjecture, then um, this would give us a great, a great bound to use for the genus 2 case. Well, uh, it, no, it works for all of them. Uh, it's just a little bit, you have, to, you have to think of how you're combining the polynomial. So you have to do something with the symmetric functions and see what the bound of the denominator should be. I think it works out to the same bound, but I haven't worked through all of the details. Even though you have sums, right? Yeah, you have sums, but somehow you have functions like over, you really have poles over an extension field, and then when you multiply them all together, it, it still gives you a bound, but just the formula might not be as nice. Yeah, you just have to unravel the sums and think about what it means, but they did, didn't want to tackle that during my talk. <laughs> so, okay, so we would like um, experimental evidence to verify this conjecture in cases where it's not proved. Okay, so uh, the one, so if we only compare this formula with the valuation of the denominators, we have this cancellation part, which even though I said is rare, it might happen and it might be hiding some of the errors. Okay, so ideally we'd also like additional ways to verify it. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute all three of these things, except um, we don't know what the cancellation factor is. We also don't know how to count multiplicity of embeddings, but the multiplicity also is something that is not there so often. So we'll just count all three and see um, see if that gives us enough, enough evidence for this conjecture. Okay, so uh, let me quickly explain how we go about counting these embeddings, um, and then I'll present the evidence that we found. Okay, so we're going to keep one of the assumptions, so which I just erased. It's not sport timing. Okay, so we're going to assume that OK is generated by just one element over OF, but we'll, won't put any assumptions on the form of eta, just whatever you want. Okay, then. Uh, so if we let omega equal d plus square root d over 2, so then 1 and omega are generators for the ring of integers. Then we have the trace of eta. Let me choose alpha 0 and alpha 1 so that this is true, and beta 0 and beta 1 so that this is true. And these are just the relative norms and traces down to the real quadratic field. Okay, then, then an embedding <coughs> uh, 
okay into an endomorphism ring. This is equivalent to giving elements lambda 1, lambda 2 in the endomorphism ring such that the following conditions hold. So we want lambda 1 plus lambda 1 joule. So this dual represents the Rosati involution. Uh, that equals each other. We want lambda 1 squared minus d lambda 1 plus d squared minus d over 4 to equal 0. Lambda 2 plus lambda 2 dual is alpha 0 plus alpha 1 lambda 1 for that the product and 5 that lambda 1 and lambda 2 commute. OK, so it's probably not so hard for you to see why this is true. Uh, basically, we're thinking of lambda 1 as the image of omega, and lambda 2 as the image of eta. And if OK is of this form, then the image of omega and the image of eta completely determine uh, the embedding. And these are the necessary sufficient conditions that need to be satisfied. So this seems like maybe a silly thing to do, because it's basically by definition. Um, but the upshot is, is that if you unravel these conditions, then it tells you that it's only a finite computation. There's only finitely many possibilities for embeddings, and you just kind of go through them all and count them. OK, so uh, the endomorphism ring of the product we can think of as matrices where you stick different uh, isogeny rings and endomorphism rings in the different places. And then composition of functions just corresponds to multiplying the matrix. So if lambda 1 is equal to this a, b, c, d, and lambda 2 is x, y, z, w, so then conditions 1 and 2 imply that a is an integer, d is equal to the discriminant minus a, c is equal to b joule, and the degree of b is equal to minus a squared plus d a minus d squared minus d over 4. And this is positive. OK? So this tells you that there's only finitely many possibilities for a and b, because there's only so many integers where this will be a positive number. And then you want an isogeny of a fixed degree. There's only finitely many of those. So this restricts lambda 1 to just finitely many cases. And then 3, 4, and 5 tell you that z is equal to alpha 1 b joule minus y joule. And that the degree of x, the degree of w, and the degree of y b dual are all bounded. Okay. It gives you a bit more information than this, but this is enough to tell you that already this also reduces lambda 2 to finitely many possibilities. So um, I'm not saying that this is the smartest way to do it or the fastest way to do it. It is just a way that works, and it's enough that you can compute it. Um, I think if you wanted to compute a lot of these or your discriminants were very large, then you probably want to choose a correct basis, a different omega and a different eta, so that these are short vectors and that sort of thing. But uh, if you just want to do it, then you can just pick whatever you want and hope it works. OK. So we take this. So then for a fixed E and E prime, we have finitely many choices for what's in the endomorphism ring. Since our curves are super singular, then we just 
change this into a problem of counting elements into orders and ideals in the quaternion algebra BP infinity. So we have magma code that just goes through and does all of this. And then you count the number of automorphisms, mod out by the isomorphisms. It's kind of tedious, but that's what a computer's for. OK, so that's how we count the number of embeddings. And OK, so let me uh, just explain a few more things before I introduce the data. Uh, so one thing is that even though um, even though we can't count the multiplicity of the embeddings, we can sort of check if we're getting, we can have a little bit of extra assurance because the Brunier-Yang formula also includes counting multiplicity. So the Brunier-Yang formula This uh, order of p to the t plus 1, this counts the multiplicity. So we can pull this out of the formula, write it as a separate factor, and then we can see if we at least have the number correct and uh, that all we're missing is the multiplicity. And the other thing is, if we're missing multiplicity and this up to cancellation, if the formula is correct, it should always be should always be larger than the other two values. If there's cancellation that we're not seeing, it will make the primes appearing in the denominator smaller. And if we're mis missing multiplicity, they will also reduce our number. So the Brunier-Yang formula should only be overcounting things, never undercounting. OK, so I think uh, that's all I need before I present the data. Does anyone have any questions before the board disappears? <laughs> no? OK, then uh, could I get the slide, please? Magic. Okay. Okay, so the examples we used were the uh, 13 examples that von Wommelen computed. These are all of the genus 2 curves with CM that are defined over Q. Okay, so uh, in this slide I have the CM field, what D tilde is, and then so this is one-sixth of the constant term. Um, there's uh, a little bit of fudging at 2 and 3, um, because these are their extra powers. So you have to normalize a little. If you want to know the exact details of how we get the 2 and 3 powers, then you can ask me afterwards. OK, so this is the case where the conjecture is proved, so it better be all right. Uh, and you see we do get agreement everywhere. The only where that we're missing agreement is our number of embeddings. We only get two embeddings at 3, whereas we're supposed to get a 3 to the fourth into the denominator. But this is this multiplicity 2. This is the factor that I pulled out. So it looks like everything is OK. We just missed that multiplicity 2. And you can see, at least in these five examples, um, multiplicity doesn't appear that often. It only appeared at one prime uh, only, only once. OK, so let's look at the next group. So these are ones where d tilde is no longer prime. We have a square factor, but they're still all 1 mod 4. If you notice, we still uh, you have all the agreement there. Um, so the reason why there's two values for the Igusa invariant is for this, for this field, there are two curves with CM by that field. And since these are all defined over Q, the Igusa variants are over Q. So this is actually giving you the Igusa variant of each curve, not just the product and the constant term. But if you take the product, then you see that we get what you get by all the other cases. OK, so it's still looking good. And now we get to the times where d tilde is highly divisible by 2. And you see kind of goes haywire. So uh, the ones where I have double stars, 
this one, the discriminant of the real quadratic field is 8. So this doesn't even fall under the conjecture. But you know, it would be nice to have a formula in all cases. So we figured we'd run it anyway, see if we can see what happens and what discrepancy occurs. OK, so I'm going to divide these up into a few different cases. OK, so the first one is when d is 8, you see that there are just lots of extra primes, many extra powers. I mean, all the other ones, the number of primes should at least, the primes that are appearing should at least be agreeing. You know, maybe the powers are off, but the primes that are appearing should always be right. If the, you can't, I mean, we can't be missing a prime just because we can't count multiplicity. I mean, we can find every embedding. So, um, um, so in this case, uh, Brunier and Yang, well, uh, so in the proof, Yang shows that you need to consider only need to consider integers m and n such that m squared d tilde minus n squared over 4d is a positive integer divisible by p. But if you go through his proof of why you only need to consider these, this really highly relies on the fact that d is 1 mod 4 and prime. And so when we were looking through the data of what m and n come up, it looks like you need an additional condition. So for these fields, uh, our guess is that you need the condition 8m plus n is congruent to 0 mod 16. So this is for these fields what it looked like numerically. And if you impose that additional condition in the formula, then those all disappear. So OK, that's not a proof, just something to think about. OK, so that looks much better. Uh, there's not these huge extra numbers, these ugly exponents. OK, so then the uh, second condition, the second discrepancy I want to focus on is um, these twos. So you see most of the other differences are all of these twos. So uh, I mean, when we find an embedding, there is actually an embedding. So that means there is a curve that that two should actually be appearing in the denominator. So the reason why it's missing in the denominators is probably because of cancellation. But we don't, we haven't proved that. But I mean, we can miss things in the embedding, but we can't count things that are not there. So definitely all the twos should be appearing. Uh, and then the fractional multiplicity um, part. So I'm not sure what's going wrong, but uh, if you again go through Yang's proof, uh, What Yang proves is that uh, under his assumptions, all of the times you will get a non-zero row value, this will happen for the multiplicity. That the order of p at the integral prime, you get m squared d tilde minus n squared over 4d plus 1, that this will be equal to the prime lying over it, uh, the order of this element. plus 1, and in particular, that this order is always odd. OK, so this, this statement just falls apart when, uh, when you're in these cases. I mean, if you try to work through the formula and you see the m and n that are causing these three halves, 
you'll see that this is not true. This is something like 16. So you're getting an even number, so you always have a fractional multiplicity. And uh, I don't understand the rest of it enough to say how to fix it, but at least this is what's going wrong. And then uh, maybe you found the last mistake by looking at it. But um, you'll see in this last field, uh, from the Igusa invariance and from the embeddings, we get a 23 to the fourth. But Bruni Yang has a 23 squared. So as I mentioned, Bruni Yang should never undercount. If we're missing things because of multiplicity or because of this cancellation, Bruni Yang should always be larger. So this is not, this discrepancy is not arising because of multiplicity or cancellation. It's arising because of something else. And this I cannot find in the proof. I mean, this, this discrepancy is very mysterious to me, and I don't, I don't see where in the proof the assumption that d tilde is prime is causing you to get lesser, a lesser power for 23. OK, so I'll leave you with that and end here. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yes. So these chi's and size you had, so you should know more about this than I do, but in my experience, they're <laughs> some sort of modular form mm -hmm. on some complex upper half space. Yeah. So what does it mean for them to be defined over at the bar? Oh, um, well, uh, <laughs> if you evaluate them at C points. Okay. So, okay. So Dave's question was, um, in his experience, these chi i's are modular forms, and they are uh, evaluated and defined on some complex upper half space. Um, and he wanted to know how you evaluate them at FP points. And Kristen said that if you evaluate them at CM points, then you get um, then you get values which are in number fields. So then you can think about them and reduce mod p. Thanks again.